So let's move on to the second uh, lecture. So Hedega san, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's not so much a lecture, and I don't have any pictures, so we average out uh, to do quite well, I suppose. Um, as uh, I was introdu introduced as a climatologist or as a meteorologist, you will expect me to talk about climate change in the context of uh, green growth, and that's what I will try, attempt to do. Now, climate change as such is rather well understood, and we know what needs to be done. It's simple. We just have to reduce or avoid in the longer run greenhouse gas emissions. And the question is, can green growth or green economy, um, is that a concept that will help us to do that? I think it is because uh, that's what it aims to do. That's what its, uh, what its purpose is. But can it deliver? And how far can it take us? Economists have developed a to me, a very useful diagram showing on the vertical axis GDP and on the horizontal axis greenhouse gas emissions per GDP. So you have greenhouse gas intensity. Um, now, if you draw a line of constant greenhouse gas emissions, that line reads something yeah, from your, from your point of view like that, it is something like that. Um, so uh, this line, constant greenhouse gas emissions, is uh, a line that we cannot cross if we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the whole diagram is divided into two parts. One part that is not acceptable because greenhouse gases will uh, increase, and another part um, that is partly acceptable because if we are talking about green growth, it means uh, you're real, uh, um, uh, the real situation must move upwards in the diagram because GDP is moving upwards. Uh, if we accept GDP as, a, as a, 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 an acceptable measure for green growth. Um, now, if you look at what different nations have been doing, you will find that practically none of them has kept to the left side of this curve, Practi all, practically all of them have an increase in uh, uh, greenhouse gases, uh, except for some exceptions with very specific situations which, will, which are not structural changes which will keep the, the, uh, the developments on that side of the, of the curve. So very few countries have managed to stay on the safe side of the curve. Now, if you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you still have to shift that curve. Um, you have to go beyond uh, what uh, is expected to keep them constant. How far do we have to shift the curve? Now, reducing greenhouse, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the extent of reductions needed, I find are somewhat obscured by looking at it in a global manner. Uh, we talk about 30, 50 percent till 2030, 2050, and it all sounds rather uh, feasible. These percentages are meant to guarantee, or at least to make probable, that the two degrees are not exceeded. Two degrees are important. Uh, two degrees warming are important because beyond that, uh, it is very likely that we are not able to stabilize climate. So uh, Kevin Anderson did a nice calculation uh, showing uh, what is possible, what kind of emissions are possible uh, if we want to stay within the two-degree limit. And uh, he started out with the non-Annex 1 countries and um, calculated what would the emissions be in a very tough kind of agreement. Uh, could we negotiate an agreement which said something like a 3% growth in greenhouse gas emissions, which is about, uh, it's less than half of what China, the growth rate China has at present, um, and a peak in 2025, and after that a decrease of 7% per year. Now, 7% is more than any nation, any mature economy has so far achieved. Uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was 5% decrease. Uh, but uh, we would be negotiating for 7% decrease. So this is really a, uh, it's, it's tough on uh, these countries, but assuming that um, they would agree to that, 
that this is uh, the kind of um, regime they would agree to. Now, according to um, Anderson's calculations, this means for the industrialized countries that we would have had to stop emitting greenhouse gases 2010. There's nothing left for us if we accept this for the uh, non-Annex I countries. Um, and I think it is important to communicate that, that if we are very stringent on uh, developing countries and, and economies in transition, uh, it still means that we have to stop. Um, so uh, this is a different message from 30 to 50 percent by 2030-2050. Uh, now this reduction, everybody will agree, uh, in the time available, which is practically no time, is not feasible economically. We can't do that. Um, on the other hand, accepting more than two degrees warming is not feasible ethically. We can't accept more than two degrees uh, if we cannot stabilize climate at more than two degrees temperature increase. So um, we're in a dilemma. We can neither go the one way nor the other way. Uh, Dennis Meadows has been saying for several years that if we cannot solve our problems abiding by the rules, we have to change the rules if we want to solve the problems. Now, we cannot change the laws of physics, and the two degrees limit uh, is based on laws of physics. But we can change man-made economical systems. And this is also something that we need to communicate. Now, what kind of new rules do we need? Is green economy, is green growth the kind of new rule that we need? Certainly to a certain extent. But I think it goes beyond that. And of course, this is now a, a question of definition. How broad do you define green economy? But these new rules must make it possible to produce less and to um, accept something which is not growth, but which is degrowth. There's so many things we don't really need, uh, so many things uh, we do not necessarily produce they, we do, we, we, that are not really necessary to produce. Um, so uh, green economy might cover that. Green growth probably would not cover these rules. Uh, these rules must also reward longer-term thinking, and they must also reward sustainable actions, which at the moment our economy does not do. And they must be part of a more general transition that is called on for many reasons. Uh, we're we're, we've talked about in the last few days about biodiversity loss. We've talked about very many physical boundaries that are just there and that we're running up to, up, up against. It's not just climate change. I'm not as pessimistic as Dennis Meadows is, who says it is too late for sustainability and therefore also for green economy. Um, he says we need to focus on resilience. But I don't really have a scientific basis on which to base this, this feeling that we still can do something. Um, and I doubt whether we could have such a basis. But happily, the transition to sustainability and the transition to resilience require in many cases the same type of things to do, the same type of actions. There's much in common if we're work, walking towards sustainability as when we're walking towards resilience. So we don't really need to decide that question whether it's still feasible or not uh, before acting. We don't have to decide that question before going forward. But I think it is necessary to also communicate, and this is part of this policy, uh, of this, this issue of science to policy, I think it is also necessary to, to communicate that we cannot be sure that we can still manage, that we can still um, uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, um, find solutions that, are that we can implement in time to prevent the consequences that we think undesirable. Finally, transformation involves, I believe, of necessity, a change of values. Essentially, we need a shift in emphasis from extrinsic values, such as money, status, competition, 
towards intrinsic values, values such as sense of community, cooperation. Because without that, we will not be able to address these problems that are not in the immediate self-interest of the person acting upon them uh, because it's something for the general good, something for future generations. And without the intrinsic values, people are not very apt to act in the necessary way. But this shift of value is also something which needs public discussion. Uh, psychology has advanced very far, and I suppose we could have some sort of some sort of um, um, uh, drive of manipulating people towards such values. But I think it is part of the ethics and part of uh, what sustainability is about that we should debate this. That we really should debate this issue of change changes in values. The nice thing about it is that a change in values, and there's an um, ample scientific basis for this, that a change in values can lead to more satisfying lives because people who are more, who put more emphasis on intrinsic values uh, generally are more satisfied, are more, uh, uh, have more satisfying lives. So there is a trade-off between standard of living and quality of life. You can talk about reducing or changing the standard of living, or what we call standard of living, uh, for more quality of life. And this is also something I believe we need to communicate. We have to communicate that the transformation that is necessary can have very direct and very individual rewards. This is essential because positive pictures trigger action much more so than fear of loss. So we have to change, make a change in our, in our discussion of the problems. And I think uh, green economy is doing some of this, showing positive developments that can take place. But to my understanding, what I have seen of green economy as it is being sold or as it is being propagated now, this change in basic approach has not taken place. It is still replacing the present products by more environmentally friendly products, processes, but it is not a question of uh, being uh, towards um, uh, sufficiency, towards uh, making do with less without losing quality of life. And I don't think that without this shift we will be able to solve our problems, and it's not, I repeat, not just climate change. Therefore, I think green economy has potentials, but green economy needs a definition that includes a real profound change of values, because that is what makes a transformation. Thank you very much.